Andrew Gamble called Hayek. It's a very well-written book and really interesting. Uh, and we're going to see, I'm going to mention at the end of the lecture that we have a coming, upcoming lecture by uh, uh, Professor Bruce Caldwell. Uh, of, uh, and he is the sort of premier authority on Hayek. He's writing Hayek's biography. So you'll get uh, a different detail thing uh, uh, in representation of Hayek. Now, what I was interested in when I read about Hayek was the tremendous number of parallels between Marx and Hayek. Not necessarily because they agreed about capitalism in the end, but they agreed a lot about uh, some fundamental issues. And then they had a different take on those issues. So I wanna uh, uh, begin by saying that Hayek is considered a liberal. Now the word liberal in those days, and it's what's called classical liberalism now, means a fundamental commitment to private property, a laissez-faire in the market economy, free trade at the international level, and the rule of law, and one of whose principal purposes is to protect private property and the market. So that the state does have a function, but that's its principal function is to protect uh, that. And that's different from the term liberalism that became in the 20th century about uh, commitment to egalitarian goals and restrictions on the market and reliance on the state. I'm gonna mention later Andrew Yang would be an example of social liberalism. You know, an entrepreneur, uh, favorably, favorable, uh, strongly in favor of capitalism, but also he wants to put capitalism with the human face. And that's a second social liberalism. So I'm using liberalism in the sense that neoliberalism has been used, which is the market uh, favoring and oriented um, philosophy. But to tell you a little bit about Hayek, uh, he was born in 1889 and uh, died in 1992. And his early work was on money and business cycles. In fact, he was hired to oppose, to counter Keynes. And unfortunately, that didn't work very well because Keynes is a pretty hard person to argue against. And, and uh, so Hayek, in fact, left LSE and went back uh, and began to work on what became his signature, which is a work on capitalism, socialism, on politics uh, instead of the economics. He didn't really have much of a reputation as an economist because his work didn't uh, succeed, uh, but his uh, uh, view and, and role in the world was greatly uh, enhanced by the uh, revival uh, of uh, liberalism, neoliberalism, and also the failure of the Soviet Union and existing socialisms. So uh, he became sort of the, the prophet of that and also uh, the great, uh, what's the right word? He was greatly revered among uh, right-wing institutions and particularly very conservative right-wing institutions. Now, his, he's often taken as uh, someone who predicted the collapse of uh, what uh, Soviet Union and other things, and that is quite true, he did. But one must mention also that others predicted the collapse, beginning with Trotsky, people sort of forget that one, uh, who says that USSR must democratize or perish. And Marxists like Hillel Tipton, uh, world system theorists like Gunde Frank, Emmanuel Wallerstein, uh, so on. Now Hayek burst into prominence when he received the Swedish Central Prize Bank, Swedish Central Bank Prize in memorial of Alfred Nobel. That was a prize at that time whose goal was to revive classical liberalism against social liberalism, which had begun to take over in Europe and Sweden and the central bankers who were giving out the prize uh, were very uh, concerned with that and wanted to revive. And Hayek became sort of the icon of that new view. If you want to read about the history and purpose of the Nobel Prize, especially in its beginning, uh, you should read a book called The Nobel Factor, The Prize in Economics, Social Democracy, and the Market Turn, uh, 
by uh, uh, Gabriel Offer, uh, I'm sorry, by uh, uh, a, a Professors Offer and Soderberg. Professor Offer is the Tichel Professor at Oxford University and a well-known historian. So Hayek starts from his view of human nature. And that's very important because his view of human nature is one uh, which we recognize when we take any course in micro and uh, in economics he's a. It's fair to say that he had a very low opinion of human nature. Humans are by nature lazy, improvident, and wasteful. And therefore, only when they were compelled by circumstances and regulated by institutions could human beings be made to behave in certain ways that would increase their wealth, use resources economically, and adjust means to a rational manner. So he's not saying, as Neoclassica would say, that's in human nature to make rational choices, or on the contrary, he's saying it's against human nature to behave this way, but they have to be made to behave that way for the good of society. Uh, he said that this view, in his opinion, was grounded in scientific reality and was what he would call scientific liberalism. That's an interesting echo of the idea of scientific Marxism, grounded in uh, uh, analysis of, of pre-existing societies. Uh, he came to uh, oppose, however, what he called the idea of rationalism, which is that people make choices on rational basis. He always thought that was nonsense. And for that reason, he was opposed to neoclassical economics, strongly opposed. So if you want, if you look in the history of economics, you have on one side, neoclassicals who dominate the landscape now, the other side, Keynesian, neo-Keynesian, Marxist, social democrats, and liberals in the classical sense, Hayek and von Mises. In talking about capitalism, the first step, other than human nature, is to talk about the rise of capitalism. And this is obviously a uh, 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 parallel to Marx. Uh, I'm going to come back to Marx's view of human nature a little bit later. Uh, Hayek says, look, civilization rose about 8,000 years ago, and urban life only uh, 3,000 years ago. In a long struggle to have rational thought dominate over instincts and emotions. Now notice it's not rational thought comes from humans, but they, it has to dominate their instincts and emotions, which were more suited to hunter, gatherer, and tribal life. And this is important because hunter gatherers are sort of origins of humanity. And uh, what he calls a great society comes about, he says, through a slow evolution of civilization. So civilization moves slowly towards capitalism. And over the course of many generations, the natural instincts of people, tribal bands and other things, I'm going to talk about more of them, uh, uh, which, uh, I'm sorry, were moved towards uh, rational, towards uh, uh, self-interest, towards uh, concern with the market. And it's only in a society held together by exchange uh, that you get instrumental orientations to action. Once such a system is established, every man lives by exchanging or becoming in some measure a merchant, and so society itself grows into what is properly a commercial society. Now notice again the parallel between the argument in Marx that capitalism is a generalization of exchange and a generalization of commodity production, which imposes a discipline, and uh, a, sometimes a painful discipline, on people within capitalist society. And uh, in fact, Hayek says that you must impose a severe discipline on human beings who must repress their instincts and preferences learned in millennia spent in hunting and gathering. So the tribal instincts and instincts that relate to people and to caring about people, these must be uh, eliminated or repressed. And for therefore, what Hayek calls a great society by his own definition is against nature. 
It's not natural. And that's why I so strongly opposed to uh, neoclassical economics. Now, you can see again the parallel to Marx. This is reading from a, a long quote of Marx, which is in the early epochs of society, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. And in the Middle Ages, we have feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, and serfs. In almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. So here's a key point that the pre-existing societies are class societies. Again, a very important point in Marx. So from this, he com Marx comes to modern society. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms, but it has established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. So you can see the contrast here uh, in, in uh, Marx and Hayek. This is, of course, the Communist Manifesto that I just read from. So now we come to the idea of the benefits of capitalism. Again, you see this opposition. Uh, Hayek says, a great society has made possible the support of a population far in excess of the size sustained by any previous society. Hayek and Mises repeatedly insisted that there's no other possible form of society that could support the present size of the world population. Again, you can see the whole uh, echo of them in the discussions about uh, modern uh, wealth and poverty and inequality and how to support the world population. According to Hayek, civilization arose through a process of spontaneous, unplanned development, not by design. So he has no time for the idea of social contracts, states of nature, or any other devices of what he called rationalist liberalism. These devices are uh, uh, not necessary because civilization has been built on the evolution of rules and institutions the rationale for which no one has ever fully understood. Uh, Hayek's argument is not that it's, is that it's not necessary to understand them. Human beings are not ready to understand them because they're too ready to denounce submission to the impersonal, impersonal forces of the market. So you can't have human beings talk about it because they always, they can tend towards denouncing the fact that they are, uh, 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 required to submit to the market, uh, and they therefore tend to see the market as an arbitrary power of other men, which is not how Hayek says. The difference in power in the market is not arbitrary, Hayek says, it's for the general good. And the existing social uh, arrangements of capitalism in the market have to be understood as the accumulated wisdom of many generations and therefore not alike likely to be set aside or reconstructed. Now this is an interesting point here because he's saying that people uh, didn't create modern society and that no one could have envisioned it. And yet later when von Mises and Hayek are talking, they attack Marx for not having given a blueprint for socialism. So they say you can't have a blueprint for capitalism because it didn't come from anyone's conscious plan, they nonetheless attack the idea of social, socialism. So then he goes on to this idea of fairness. You know how when I talked about social liberalism, uh, capitalism, the human phase, it should be fair. He says the notion of fairness, it belongs to pre-modern societies. Fairness implies that there should be a connection between individuals, uh, merit and reward. And the merit is say based on effort and uh, uh, other things and also uh, uh, characteristics of their location. A market breaks that link, Hayek says. He says that the market does not reward the most deserving individuals they don't receive the highest reward. And some of the least, uh, and some of the 
uh, most rewarded are the least deserving. So he says, if you want the benefits of a market order in terms of liberty and prosperity, we have to accept the outcomes that we disapprove. Freedom means that in some measure, we have to entrust our fate to the forces that we do not control. I'm gonna mention later that Hayek says that one of the tasks of capitalism is to extinguish the natural tendency of children and younger people to care about other people to have some connection to them and care about what happens to them. That has to be extinguished and that is one of the fundamental uh, uh, needs of education according to Hayek. It must teach people that they will not be rewarded because they're the best, they'll not be rewarded for their merit, they will be rewarded because the market has selected them from other things and they can't say that they were better or better educated or smarter or anything like that. That's very interesting I thought, I think. Now, when it comes to capitalism, he is an enthusiastic of the factory system because it imposes discipline and position on the workforce. Yet he's opposed to any attempt to organize the whole of society in a similar, in a similar manner. So he, he likes the factory system, which is most of society, uh, as he himself says, but he's opposed to organizing uh, the whole of society that way, because that would be totalitarianism. And notice what he means by this then. The bulk of society, what, 90% is, is subject to the discipline of the uh, factory, not the market alone, but the factory, which is good. But the other 10% should not be interfered with because they represent, so to speak, the winners in the market. And Interestingly, when he talks about competition in the market, he does not say that the market uh, succeeds. It's not neoclassical theory. It's not optimal and efficient. He says the development, uh, or he says basically, the development society depends not on any single uh, invisible hand outcome, but rather the outcome against of many clashes of individual wills, the product of many experiments, many mistakes, many failures, as well as successes. There is an order to society, but this order comes from that collision, that set of collisions, rather than some kind of grand uh, design. So it's a spontaneous order. It's the unintended consequence of all the agents using their local knowledge at their disposal to pursue their interests within a framework of general rules that prescribe conduct. This is spontaneous order. It's what we would call now uh, an emergent property. He's saying that this order emerges. So this is his vision of this invisible hand. It's not for the good of individuals, it's the good of society as a whole because it creates greater wealth in, in the liberty. Uh, the market in this way determines the appropriate allocation of resources. He does not say the best. He does not say the most efficient. He does not say the optimal. He says it's appropriate. And if we tamper with this, we are tampering in the judgment of the market and we're imposing our own judgment on what market services are worth. And this will distort the market and lead to a misallocation of resources and eventually to the impoverishment of people and the loss of liberty. Again, the contrast here is not just against Marx, but also against neoclassical economics. And that's why he's not a neoclassical. He doesn't believe in optimality and efficiency and all of that of the market, quite the contrary. It, it selects by collision and failure, important point. Some try and some succeed and some fail. He defends the concentration of power, of large-scale capital and existence of uh, companies that are big, vertically, you know, uh, capital intensive and combining many different companies. He says they are not monopolies, unlike trade unions, which are monopolies in his view, because they will be constrained by competition. 
So uh, big concentrated capitals are good uh, because they are subject to competition. Now, I'm going to come back to this point, but this is a very important point in Marx also. I have argued throughout that Marx argues that concentration and centralization. Centralization is the ownership of many individual branches of production by one company or set of countries. Concentration is an increase in capital intensity and scale of production. I would argue that Marx says that this in, in, uh, in, intensifies competition. And if you've taken my courses, you know the details of that argument. Uh, that it makes competition in a sense more cruel and more abstract because a large corporation doesn't give a damn about where it's located or who's working for it or who's employed by it, or who's running it. It cares about profit. Uh, from here, he moves to the question of method. And the only appropriate method, he says, it has to start from individuals and their subjective valuations and only this way can we discover the common principles that underlie all human societies. Now, of course, here he's not saying how these subject evaluations are created, but earlier I mentioned that he believes it's very important to create the idea of these valuations and to extinguish among younger people, especially, and people who are you know, uh, concerned about other people, extinguish that idea because that idea is destructive to capitalism. It brings into all these things about fairness and equality and uh, all of that, which should not be permitted. Capitalism does, in a sense, the socially, historically uh, best thing. Now, here you see his emphasis on the power of what Marx would call the bourgeoisie and the importance of the bourgeoisie and the non-importance, or at least the need to keep in its place not only human nature, but the working class. And you can see how Marx has a somewhat different view. Again, I'm gonna read you a quote from Marx. The bourgeoisie historically has played a most revolutionary role. The bourgeoisie, whatever it, whenever it's got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, pat patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his so-called natural superiors and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man other than naked self-interest. You see the echo here. Uh, Hayek is saying you should do that and capitalism does that and Marx is saying that capitalism does that though he doesn't say you should do that. Left uh, uh, remaining the callous callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism, uh, in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It, is it has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefensible chartered freedoms, it has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. In other words, for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. You can see how much Marx picks up or how much Hayek picks up from the idea of what capitalism does, but you also see the core of Marx is different, which is classes, exploitation, and brutality. Now, it's interesting that Marx comments on what Hayek calls classical uh, liberalism because there's already in economics what's called classical liberal political economy. And he says it has a very truncated view of history. For them, there had been history, but there was no longer any history. History was a period of the long painful struggle during which human societies had gradually evolved institutions of a liberal order. That's word for word what Hayek says. And this is from Marx, okay? And then Marx comes back to this point. How do you start to analyze society? 
Hayek says you should start with the individual, not as a nice person, not as a person who cares about, but an individual socialized by capitalism, created in a sense and maintained by capitalism, who does, who focuses on uh, gain through the market. And Marx says only a method that can start from classes can understand capitalism. So he doesn't start from the individual, he starts by the location of the individual in classes. Now Marx also picks up on this idea that the invisible hand creates the order of the market. But it creates the order, and, and also he picks up the idea it creates it through collision, which is what Hayek says. Uh, but here his emphasis is on labor, because production is a labor process and commodity production throws onto the market all these different commodities based on the expectations and, and goals and hopes of individual producers of commodities and hence also the individual laborers. And what happens is that these are inconsistent. When you sell something, you're not just hoping to sell it, you're hoping that other people will buy it and therefore you're making a judgment about their actions. And their actions then depend on the actions of other people because they're also hoping when they do something that they can either sell or buy. So each individual is making, in a sense, uh, a, a calculation of the local consequences of the whole uh, market. And that those consequences, as Hayek himself says, are frequently wrong. What comes, uh, the order comes through collision. And this is exactly what Marx says, only he says the social integration that this order represents is the integration of individual laborers, commodity producing laborers, into the needs of society. So they have to produce the right amount of consumption goods and the right amount of investment goods and the luxury goods and all of that. And that comes about not through some optimality, but through the clash of individual goals and actions and the social needs. So in Marx also, this is an emergent property, but in Marx, and indeed it might be said in Herod, the order comes about in and through disorder. That's one of my favorite phrases, because it's not the optimality of neoclassic economics, which, Herod, which uh, Hayek also sneers at, but rather a collision, a set of collisions that imposes some kind of order on the system. Now, Hayek says that a crucial feature of the market is that it functions as a discovery process through which new ways of satisfying uh, uh, consumers are constantly discovered. Now here, the focus is on the satisfaction of consumers. Marx also says that capitalism, uh, uh, a constant feature is the discovery of new processes, but it is a uh, discovery of new processes in order to lower costs and to gain bigger markets and lowering costs enables them to compete more effectively with other capitalists. So this is the explanation Marx of the constant move towards mechanization. It's not just a discovery of new processes, it's the new processes that'll gain more profit. Very important point in Marx. It's the profit that regulates these new profits, new processes, not uh, the goal of satisfying human needs. And Hayek also says that the market is very dynamic. It's always new processes, new activities, some win, some fail. And Marx also says the same thing. Capitalism is very dynamic. It evolves quickly. And it's historically evolved. It's spread across the world and different nations adapted to their cultures and also taken them over. The common driving force in Marx is profitability, but the evolution again, as in Herod, comes about through errors and variations, some of which survive and others don't. And when I was reading this, I was very much struck by the fact that in biological evolution, uh, one of the crucial things about capitalism, I'm sorry, about biology, is that mutations come about because of errors and replication. It's not like the virus is thinking, aha, they're gonna give me penicillin, I'm gonna mutate and go against penicillin. Reproduction produces errors. Evolution selects those errors which happen to be beneficial. So mutation is the selection process of errors. 
And that is pretty close to what Harris says. I mean, not what Hayek says. And also Hayek, by the way, uh, also talks about the fact that capitalism is destructive to methods which are not successful in the market. So there's no sense that it, it has a soft, invisible hand. Now, both Hayek and Marx strongly oppose what would be called uh, bourgeois economics in Marx, and it's called uh, modern economics in the time of Hayek, which is neoclassical economics. Because neoclassical economics is also pro-market, is also minimal state. It's also the idea that uh, capitalism is the best of all possible worlds, and perhaps the only possible world. But uh, both argue that uh, this is a fantasy. That's not how capitalism operates. It operates through errors, through mistakes, through a, a selection process of these errors. And therefore, there's no notion of optimality inherent, as it, neither is there in Marx. Uh, there is a notion of a process of collision. And as I pointed out, both of them argue that concentration and centralization intensify competition, not uh, 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 suppress it. And I make this point because it is a very common point on the left since Hilferding to argue that concentration centralization has overturned the laws of competition and by the way therefore made Marx irrelevant because Marx is all about competition and now the new laws of monopoly. And you can see a big section in my book about monopoly and empirical evidence and modern views of monopoly. Um, now, let me turn to this idea, which is again common to Marx and Hayek, which is that capitalism has to create a new uh, consciousness. Hayek says that the real dilemma in teaching the young is how to teach them that many of them will, who are worthy will not succeed, and many who are unworthy will fail. How do you teach students, he says, and you teach them to study and you teach them to work hard and then you have to teach them that the best ones may fail and the worst ones may succeed. That's a dilemma of capitalism. And he goes on to say the two chief characteristics of the push for socialism are altruism and solidarity. But the two virtues of liberalism are freedom and responsibility. These moral rules have to be learned by every generation and they involve, I'm quoting from Harrod, they, I'm quoting from the uh, discussion of Harrod, involves suppressing the deeper moral instincts that every individual inherits. Everyone, he says, is born a socialist so that before individuals can become citizens of the great society, they have to learn through a personal struggle how to overcome their socialist selves. I think that's a beautiful phrase. It's very clear uh, uh, that what and Branko Milanovic wrote to me uh, about this said that Hayek is basically saying that capitalism has to overcome our innate preferences for solidarity and justice. And we have to accept that capitalism must often be unjust in order to succeed. And he made the point, uh, Branco made the point, that it's very similar to Pareto's view, that a society to function, one needs to construct uh, myths of the importance of uh, 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 the, uh, of capitalism. And these myths have to uh, convince people that what happens to them is in the natural order. And they have to get rid of ideas of religion morals and fairness, because these are false ideas. These ideas will impede capitalism. Now what's interesting is that Hayek makes it very clear that this is a false consciousness in the sense that it goes against what uh, individuals tend to do, which is talk, relate to other people, relate to ideas of justice and all of that. And Marx calls the same creation of the false consciousness of the virtues of the market and the importance of that, he calls it uh, uh, false consciousness. I, I shouldn't have said the word false consciousness. He calls it false consciousness. Consciousness. It's a consciousness created by capitalism that 
to be selfish is the best for society. And obviously, in the many paragraphs and discussions, Marx about false consciousness and political organizing. But they agree at some fundamental level that capitalism does not reward the best, but only those most successful for its particular domain. And Marx, by the way, does not, as I started from the Communist Manifesto, does not deny the power of capitalism or its uh, 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 appeal. He says that you have to penetrate this appeal to get to the, uh, the underlying processes. The appeal, so to speak, is exchange, as he says, where everyone appears equal, but you have to go underneath the sphere of production to see the master walking ahead and the uh, 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 worker walking behind. Now, I said I tried to end at one thirty, but I was a little bit late starting, so on the role of the state. Hayek says the, the function of law in modern society is to prescribe just rules of conduct, not to become out involved in the exchange outcomes. So you have to say, these are the rules. You have to support the market. You have to respect property and private ownership and all of that. But the market, the state has no uh, reason or should not be involved in uh, the outcomes, whether one thing is good or bad, or whether it's fair, unless it's fair about property rights. He says to accept an argument based on social justice undermines the foundations of impartial justice and destroys the moral basis for free society. Because once you talk about social justice, individuals are no longer able to take res full responsibility for their actions. That is to say, if they fail, it's their fault. If they succeed, it's their virtue. And so this is Hayek's answer to the famous quote from Anatole France, which Marx also refers to, the majestic equality, the majestic in equality of the law is that it forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. And indeed, in some sense, that is what Herod is saying, and that is also what Marx is saying. <coughs> Only Marx means it as a sarcasm, and Herod means it as a virtue. So in the state in Hayek, I keep saying Herod, sorry, Hayek, uh, the state has to ensure reasonable security, property rights, uh, but you have to draw a line somewhere. Now, it's interesting, later on, he does say that the state should also provide a floor to which, below which no individuals should be allowed to fall. So this is a kind of social floor, not minimum wage per se, but a kind of welfare floor. He says it should provide a minimum income and pro provide uh, opportunities to improve the conditions to all citizens. And as long as these are compatible with the rule of law and did not attempt to impose an artificial equality on the market, then that's fine. As long as they're not guided by notions of social justice. Now it's not clear why you should give a minimum floor and not be guided by implications of social justice. Because he also says the government should be involved in programs in housing, agriculture, and the environment after having said the government should not interfere in the market. And he does accept then that there are some instances in which the market does not succeed in market failure, as we now call it, neoclassic economics, and therefore there's an argument for public goods. So here he is verging into the idea that the market does not always uh, succeed, but he's, afford, he's opposed to the welfare state because it leads to the redistribution of income and to some notion of social justice, which he feels is completely destructive to capitalism. And he also opposes progressive taxation because this is taking away from people what they've earned through their success in the market, which he says is not necessarily because they're better people. And this reminded me of Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang is a capitalist, a liberal capitalist, but he wants to move towards a new form of capitalism, which is a minimum standard of living, which is uh, 
by given by a certain uh, uh, income to everybody at the bottom. He wants to move towards a capitalism that maximizes human well-being and fulfillment. Now, this is the capitalism that Hayek is opposed to. This is the social liberalism view of capitalism, which Hayek has spent his life and which Hayekians and uh, many very conservative institutions uh, have fought against. Now, I'm going to end with just a little statement. There are so many other things, Hayek and Marx, but just this part so I can make my timing. Uh, oh, I have some time. Um, Hayek entirely rejects many of the arguments, most of the arguments of neoclassical economics. He rejects the Walrasian idea of tatonement leading to general equilibrium. He's already said there's no tatonement. People collide with each other. Some get killed, some survive, some get stronger, and that collision is what produces the order. And that's the same thing as in Marx, the order through disorder, through the collision of individual wills. So that's a similar argument. And he's, he, he sneers, he looks down on the neoclassical idea that uh, uh, capitalism uh, achieves some kind of general equilibrium. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting, while Ross was actually a socialist who believed that the state was necessary to achieve this general order of the capitalist system. And of course, you can imagine that Hayek was strongly opposed to that, but so was Marx. Now, Hayek does move to the idea that coordination depends uh, of individuals depends on information. And you can see that idea also in neoclassical economics. But he rejects entirely the idea of perfect knowledge. For him, the whole point of the market is that market enables people to uh, use their knowledge, which may be wrong, to uh, act in the market. And if their knowledge is wrong, their understanding is wrong, they fail. But if it is right, they get rewarded. And so it is a market rewarding, uh, a knowledge rewarding thing, but not because it produces uh, perfect knowledge, but because it extinguishes a knowledge which doesn't survive. And as he said, it's not necessarily the knowledge of the best, it's the ones most successful in the market. And he says uh, he's opposed to the idea of uh, neoclassic economics because it could be used to support socialist conclusions. And here is the socialist debates, which I may cut to if I have time, about how the market functions, whether socialism could be better than the market. And Hayek and von Mises were very involved in that. The market, he says, is an order of a natural system of liberty whose beneficial results come about through unintended consequences. You notice again the reference to emergent properties of unintended consequences of social action rather than through intellectual foresight. He never said that the market ensures efficiency. He is opposed to the idea that it, uh, it, it, opposes, it, it leads to uh, optimality. In fact, his whole theory of knowledge is knowledge through discovery and error is opposed to any notions of optimality. He says there is no such thing as an optimum that could be found. The market is an imperfect institution in Hayek's view, like all human institutions, because of uncertainty, because of ignorance, but it is less imperfect than other uh, alternatives and certainly less imperfect than any attempt to centralize knowledge as in a socialist economy. So it's imperfect, yes but it's less imperfect than the alternatives. Now, I, I was struck also here by a contradiction in Hayek. Uh, Hayek has said that the market reflects the social choices of individuals and social desires of individuals. But he's also said that education must extinguish the tendency for these social desires to relate to other people and equality and so on. So that means the social desires of individuals in the market are created, not uh, natural. And he says many times they're not natural. So here you have a contradiction. Satisfying the social desires, desires is satisfying the desires that capitalism creates. And again, an echo of Marx. Marx about commodity production, about the market, how it enforces and channels people towards self-interest and greed and against their natural uh, uh, 
uh, solidarity and altruism. Now he does say the action. Uh, he does argue for methodological individualism. He says all actions performed by individuals, uh, and therefore the analysis. All actions are performed by individuals. Therefore, the analysis of social reality must start from individuals conceived as self-sufficient fixed entities confronting the external world and responding to opportunities and constraints by making choices and dividing strategies. It doesn't mean the strategies are, uh, are uh, correct. He therefore opposes all notion of a social collective. He said there is no such thing as a social collective and therefore by implication classes, working class that has no existence and no reality because it only exists, it is uh, any uh, outcomes of the result of individual members. So a collective cannot have its own will and purpose. Individual people do what they need to do. And so a collective such as the government, the union and nations are all abstractions and have no reality between the uh, beyond the fact that they're composed of individuals acting in their interest. Now, the last point I want to bring up, <coughs> excuse me, is Hayek's political views. Hayek lived to the nineteen to nineteen ninety two, so he saw uh, the rise of of uh, uh, dictatorships all over the world, and he uh, is one of the authors of the idea of the distinction between an authoritarian regime, such as that of Pinochet's. Chile and a an totalitarian regime such as that in the Soviet Union. And what's the distinction? Uh, both destroyed political liberty. That's clear uh, in Chile, it's clear in the Soviet Union. But the authoritarian regime of Chile did not interfere with the market. It, uh, private property was left. Markets were not replaced by central direction. So even though it destroyed individual liberty, and by the way, we know tortured and destroyed large numbers of people and uh, destroyed institutions like unions and universities and uh, the state, that's acceptable because, or at least not as bad as uh, uh, totalitarian regimes that also destroy liberty. Now, you can see this as a kind of political trick because if you kill people, you sort of destroy their political liberty. And if you imprison them, you destroy their political liberty. If you drop them out of airplanes, as, as the Chilean regime does, still living, uh, and you torture them, that destroys their political liberty. But by what Hayek means by political liberty is the uh, role of the market, the dominant role of the market, and of private property. And at this point, he kind of uh, avoids the crucial issue. Now, I'm going to stop there. I have many other things to say, but I did come to 1.30, as I promised. I'm not talking about value uh, here. Hayek talks a lot about value, and what he means by value is what Marx would call, and Smith and Ricardo would call, exchange value. Is the value or utility in, in your classic economics that individuals put on, on the commodities. And uh, from his point of view, therefore, capitalism serves to serve, uh, uh, serves the preference of the individuals. Again, a contradiction, because it already said individuals have to be created in order to uh, fit the structure of capitalism. And on the other hand, he's saying the behavior and free choices are those that the market responds to. So he says the socialism and that capitalism must extinguish the socialist instincts and preferences that people tend towards. It must teach them that the market is the best and uh, the best social institution, the last historical structure, but it doesn't mean, uh, and it has to teach them to learn that even the best may fail and the worst may succeed in the market. Now, I, there's a long digression I could take about value and Marx, but I'm not going to do that here. So that I, I end at this point and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you.